So I'm Lauren McKean. I am the Open Education Librarian here at Northwestern. Uh, I support the use of open educational resources. I meet with faculty and other instructors to help them find open educational resources to use in their courses. Um, and I'm also the liaison to the Communication Studies Department. So I um, provide research support to Com studies students and am responsible for collection development within that area too. Um, I'm here with my colleague Natalie Gillespie. She is from NUIT and she will be monitoring the chat for us today. So if you have any questions throughout the time that we're here, feel free to put them into the chat and then I'll also leave a couple of minutes at the end for us to, to unmute ourselves and, and ask our questions then as well. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so to give you an overview of what we're going to cover today, I wrote up some learning objectives. Um, after today's session, you'll be able to define open educational resources and see OER as an alternative to traditional textbooks for courses. You will hopefully understand the options and support available for using, developing, and teaching with OER. Um, you will be able to identify resources for finding and using OER within your disciplines. And you'll also be able to connect with librarians who can partner with you to explore alternative course materials. I'm one of those librarians. We have another librarian named Chris Diaz who also does that work. So before we get into the details of what OER is, I just wanted to start with some context so we can better understand how and why OER has become so popular in recent years. Um, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the cost of textbooks has risen three to four times the rate of inflation in the past several years. And on this chart, you can see that the cost of textbooks in comparison to all of the other items, um, college expenses, the cost of textbooks is over here at the top. It's that little green line at the top. So the growth in the cost of textbooks far exceeds other expenses and has been compounded by things such as access codes, which I'm sure lots of you are familiar with. They are codes that um, students must access on an individual basis. It's an online system that they have to access in addition to their physical textbooks. So we can look at numbers and data, but I also wanted to share with you some stories directly from students. So last fall, um, some colleagues and I went out and we interviewed students uh, at the library at Norris, um, and also on North Campus to ask about how the cost of textbooks affects their lives and their education. Um, and we created a video. It's a super short video, so I'll play this now. Let me make a sound. somewhere between three and four hundred dollars a semester when I was an undergrad. Freshman fall I think I spent like almost a thousand dollars. I didn't realize how expensive textbook, textbooks would actually be. Even to rent the textbooks were like a hundred twenty dollars. I actually kept track of all of the money that I spent so I could report it on my taxes because it was that significant. Right, so under normal circumstances, students have had a lot of options for how they would go about getting their textbooks. But since the pandemic struck, finding access to textbooks has been a real challenge for all students. Um, during spring quarter alone, due to closures at warehouses and an increased demand for shipping, the shipping times at the Norris bookstore went from about three days to, in some cases, up to five weeks. So students were no longer able to rely on physical course reserves as well at the library um, or even borrowing or sharing copies with friends. But under normal circumstances, they would be able to go to the Northwestern bookstore, um, purchase things off of Amazon. Uh, many rent used copies, but as the one student said in the video, sometimes renting can cost up to $120 per quarter. Um, and in the end, you still have to give the book back. You don't get to sell it back and you also don't get to keep it for, um, for the future in case you wanted to use it later. 
Um, I'm sure many of you are aware, but lots of students go about finding their textbooks through illegally pirated copies online. We found out in the course of interviewing students for that video that um, there are Facebook groups and also Google Drives that are filled with course materials that students have gotten from each other. And then the stat is sort of alarming. 45% of Northwestern students have reported trying to get by without the book altogether. So if you can imagine a course that you're teaching, if this number is representative of all students at Northwestern, nearly half of your class not purchasing your required textbook or not having access to your required textbook. It's a huge number. Um, just one more stat to throw in there that that isn't listed here is that 16% of students at Northwestern have said that they've dropped classes because they couldn't afford the textbook. Um, and that was a stat that was taken last fall. So in order to promote open educational resources and other course affordability solutions, um, we at Northwestern formed a group called Affordable Instructional Resources, also known as AIR. It's a network of staff and faculty who work to support instructors to reduce the cost of course materials. The two primary sponsors of AIR are the Office of the Provost and University Libraries. Um, but while we're leading the program, one of the strengths of AIR comes in our partnerships. So we partner with uh, members from Faculty Senate, the bookstore, NUIT, um, and also uh, we've had representatives from Associated Student Government on our team before um, and have been in consultation with them about their needs. The focus areas of AIR um, are wide ranging. Today we're going to talk about open educational resources, which is something that the libraries support. But AIR focuses on promoting open ed educational resources, both through a faculty grant program um, and through creating OER bibliographies. So if any of you are interested in using OER, but you're not sure what's out there, you can contact AIR or you can contact me after today's session and I can create a bibliography for you of open educational resources that you might be able to use for your course. Um, in addition to OER, we also promote the use of course reserves, which for those of you who don't know at the library, usually course reserves are available both electronically within your Canvas course and then also physical course reserves where students can come to the library and check out a book for anywhere between two and four hours. Um, right now, due to the pandemic, physical course reserves is not available and it won't be available during fall quarter, um, which makes OER even more important at this time um, for students to be able to access things without having to pay for them. Um, in addition, we also focus on alternative course packs. So I'm sure all of you are familiar with course packs, but I'll just explain a little bit about them here. Course packs are packets of readings. Um, they're super convenient to use because it's a list of all of the readings that you want your students to have for your class. A lot of faculty will go to Quartet, which is a printing company that is in Evanston, and have a course pack printed out and then students can purchase that. Um, one of the things about course packs is that when students purchase it, they're paying for the copyright to be able to access those materials. That's, that's where the cost comes in, in addition to paying the printer, but that's the primary cost. Um, a lot of those materials, especially if they're journal articles or book chapters, are available within the library's collection. And so AIR offers a service called Syllabi Review, where you can email us your syllabus, we'll review it, and we can see what of those materials are available within the library that you could just possibly link to within your Canvas course so that students don't have to purchase a physical course pack. Um, we also promote timely textbook orders. Students can't make decisions about what classes they're going to take and what materials they're going to purchase unless timely textbook orders are put within CSER um, before pre-registration. So that's actually coming up pretty soon. If you haven't, if you know that you're teaching in fall um, and you know what course materials you're going to be using, you can go to CSER and put that information in. And if you don't have any course materials, you can put none in that box. Uh, one more thing I'll mention here is that AIR as a group was primarily created to lower the cost of undergraduate courses, but the libraries support open educational resource development 
um, and adoption for any course. So it doesn't have to be an undergraduate course. All right, now that I have mentioned OER a few times, I think that I will administer a poll because I'd really love to know what uh, your experience is with OER. Let's go ahead and launch that. Everyone has voted. I'll share the results. Um, okay, what is your familiarity with OER? Three of us, it's a new concept. Um, four have heard of it but never used it. That's probably the most common thing that I've seen at Northwestern um, and just among faculty in general. A lot of faculty have heard of OER. It's out there, um, but not sure exactly what it is or the details of how to use it. And then we have one person who has created or adapted an OER text. That's great. Okay, so what is OER? Um, OER are free teaching materials that are licensed for unrestricted distribution and modification to fit the course specific needs of instructors. OER stands for Open Educational Resources. Um, OER is an umbrella term that encompasses many different types of materials. So it could be websites or tutorials, syllabi, courses, articles, videos, podcasts. Um, here at Northwestern, we mainly focus on textbooks because we find that assisting faculty, replace, assisting faculty to replace an expensive textbook with an open one is an effective way of reducing course costs. Um, and that's one of our goals. But perhaps since many of you will be teaching in just a few short weeks for the fall, one way of dipping your toes into OER is to find some piece of open content. So it doesn't have to be a full textbook, which sometimes it could be difficult to redesign a course and adopt a new textbook. But maybe if you wanted to be able to um, just incorporate an open article and maybe rewrite that for one section of your course or incorporate an open video or even a podcast. Uh, today I'll show you two different resources. One will be a resource to find OER full textbooks, and then another one has full textbooks as well, but then it also has access to smaller bits of open content that you can peruse. So to be more specific about what makes OER open, the three primary defining characteristics are that it is free, it is usually created online and shared online, and then it has an open copyright license. Um, when you create something that's original and in a tangible medium, you automatically own the copyright to that work. It could be as minor as a note that you wrote on a piece of scrap paper. That's yours, you own the copyright. As the copyright holder, you reserve the right to access, copy, distribute, and modify your own work in whatever way you choose. Um, open copyright licenses actually work in conjunction with the copyright that you hold and they allow you to retain your own copyright while giving others permission to do all of the things, um, access, copy, distribute, modify, adapt, without asking you for permission to do it. Open licenses typically require that the user credit the person who's borrowing the work, um, or I'm sorry, open licenses typically require that the user credit the author or the copyright holder as the person who created the work. And then if they've adapted it, they can say that they've adapted it and then they can create a new version. So I included the symbol here for Creative Commons. Creative Commons is a nonprofit organization that provides these open licenses. Um, it's a way of providing standardized uh, licenses that are globally recognized around the world. So there are other ways to give materials open licenses, but Creative Commons is the most commonly used open license. You might be wondering the difference between something that's free and something that's open. Um, at libraries, we can purchase an e-textbook for our collection. And if the e-textbook has a license that allows for 
unlimited users, then that would mean that your entire class could access that textbook, that e-textbook for free. But it doesn't mean that that e-textbook is openly licensed. Um, it means that we paid for it, that the library paid for it, and then also um, you as an instructor wouldn't be able to alter the text in any way and students wouldn't be able to retain the text and sometimes even with e-textbooks students can't download the text so then they would have to access it only when they're online and we know times right now um, when people are working from home sometimes people have shaky internet and they don't always have access to internet and so um, it's not always the most reliable way. Um, so that's one example of free. Um, open, on the other hand, would be free to students, just like the e-textbook would be, but it would also come with the added flexibility and benefits that are afforded by Creative Commons licenses, such as the, the ability to remix, revise, reuse, retain, and redistribute, all again at no cost. All right, um, there isn't one size fits all with Creative Commons licenses. This is a graphic that shows the scale of openness. At the very top is a public domain license. Um, and that would mean that if you as an author wanted to give something a CC0 license, you're essentially giving it to the public. And with public domain licenses, Whoever is using your work doesn't even have to credit you if they don't want to. You've, you've given up all rights to it. Um, down at the bottom, the least open licenses, that one is BYNCND. Um, that stands for attribution. So if someone, if you give your work that license and someone uses it, they have to give you credit for it. NC means non-commercial use. So if you give your work that license, it means that whoever is using it can't make money off of it or use it in a commercial setting. Um, and ND stands for no derivatives. So that would be the most restrictive. Um, in our experience here at Northwestern, the majority of faculty who have created OER, and probably most OER in general, fall somewhere in, in the middle here. A lot of it is um, um, BYSA, BYND, or BYNC. It's not important for you to know what any of these symbols are <laughs> at this point. If ever you come across something that you want to adopt for your class, or maybe you want to adapt it, and you see these symbols and you're not sure what they mean, you can reach out to us and then we can interpret them for you and let, they know, and let you know um, what they allow you to do. So here are some examples of Creative Commons licensed materials out in the wild. Uh, this is from MIT. MIT has an open courseware project that you may have heard of. Um, they have full courses with a lot of open material. You can Google it and peruse through their classes. Um, it's not just STEM classes. They do have some humanities stuff there as well. Um, so this one is openly licensed and they put their license down at the bottom. This is an example from YouTube. Um, when you click on a video on YouTube, you can look at the description and see if the author has given the video an open license. This is an example from the libraries. I actually uploaded this video and I gave it an open license so that if anyone wanted to take the video and alter it, they could, and they would just have to give the library credit for it. This is another example. This one is from the Creative Commons image search. If you're ever looking for images to use within your presentations in your class, uh, just Google Creative Commons image and you'll see a whole database full of images that are openly licensed that all you would have to do is credit the author. Um, and then you can add it to your slides. You could add it to your presentation slides if you're going to conferences and you don't have to worry about them recording you or taking your slides and posting them to the website later. Um, I also really like the Creative Commons search tool because they have a button there where you can just copy the citation and then add it. So you might be wondering what's different about openly licensed content and any non-open content that you share with students within your Canvas course or in class presentations. Most instructional content is not distributed with an open license. Um, in fact, 
OpenStax, which is an open textbook publishing company um, organization, they have said recently that the OER or the textbook market um, has only 4% of it is OER. So it's, it's a small percent right now, but it is growing. Um, so if all rights are reserved for educational content that you're using to teach with within your class, um, that means that the author has reserved the right to reproduce the work and prepare derivatives and distribute copies, perform the work, um, and display the work publicly. So if it is all rights reserved, how is it that we're able to share some of this content with our students? Fair use. Fair use is an exception within the law that allows for a defense of copyright infringement cases. Um, to determine whether or not something is fair use, we recommend considering these four factors. The first is the purpose and character of the use, whether it's for commercial or nonprofit. Obviously, in an educational setting, it would be nonprofit, so we have that going for us. Number two is the nature of the copyrighted work the amount and substantiality of the use in relation to the work as a whole, and then the effect of the use on the potential market. So to give you an example of fair use in action, at the libraries um, during our, the school year, we have course reserves, and a lot of faculty will contact us and make a request to scan chapters of a textbook and make those available within Canvas. So it would be really great if we could scan an entire textbook and make that available to the class, but that would be violating fair use because um, it goes beyond the amount that is um, legally allowed for us to scan and make available. So when you put in a request through interlibrary loan to have parts of a textbook scanned, the interlibrary loan folks will make a call on fair use and decide how much of that textbook can legally be scanned and made available to students. Some have said a number of 15%. Um, that's not a hard and fast rule. It depends really on the size of the textbook, but it's usually between one and two chapters that we can make available um, while maintaining fair use. If you ever want to use something and you're wondering whether or not it would be infringing on copyright, um, I included a link here to the Fair Use Evaluator, and that can help you determine um, whether what you want to use is fair. Um, it's a neat tool where you can type in your use case, and then in the end, it will give you a little description. You can also contact the libraries. If ever you have a question about whether something is fair use, we have a copyright librarian who is an expert in fair use. Um, so if you contact me first, I would probably refer you to her, but you can try me. <laughs> I'll also say, since I'm sharing some links here, that I'll be um, sharing, let me actually, right now, I'll just do it, share the link to the slides so that you have them. All right, so the links to the slides are in the chat, and then I'll also send all the attendees an email after this so that you have that in your All right, so this is a question that I'd like to pose to you all, if you could unmute yourselves. Since OER eliminates the publisher from the equation um, and authors aren't receiving royalties for the copies sold, I'm just wondering if you have any guesses on who funds OER creation. Universities and their libraries? Yeah, was that Alex that I heard? <laughs> yes, and I only know that because I just got a grant from you because you did. <laughs> yes, yeah, so one way that OER is funded is through institutions. A lot of libraries and universities have started OER grant programs in order to incentivize faculty to begin incorporating OER into their classes. Um, Northwestern has an OER grant and uh, Alex was one of the recipients for the design thinking um, and communication program this past year. Um, but we open up our um, application period in January. So if any of you are interested in applying, you can do that then. There are other funding sources. Any other guesses? Uh, 
Yeah, in Europe at least, uh, the funding institutions for research projects, if you are spending public money, you are obliged to uh, disseminate your results through open access and it's mandatory. So that, is it um, government money or foundational money? Or, yeah, what yeah, did you government, government money and European Union money. Oh, I see, okay, yeah. Um, in the United States, the government also funds um, OER creation and OER projects. One example that we're going to talk about in just a minute is um, a $5 million grant that went to UC Davis last year in order to expand their STEM uh, open educational resources. Yeah, yeah, but what I mean is not creating the, the research on open educational resources, but obliging you to disseminate in an open source what you have researched with public money. Oh, okay, so you're saying that it would be open access, not necessarily open educational resources. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So open access, the difference, if anybody's wondering, the difference between open access and OER would be um, the licensing actually. O open access would mean that you would make that available to people, but they wouldn't necessarily be able to um, uh, alter it in any way. It's just that they can access it openly. Any other guesses? All right. So here are three examples. The first one is OpenStax. We didn't talk about this funding source, but um, a lot of, at least in the States, a lot of uh, OER publishers were started by foundations such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Hewlett Foundation. So OpenStax was funded in part by those two sources and a few other foundations. They're now self-sustaining. Um, and some of you may be familiar with OpenStax. They have really well-branded books that look all very similar. Um, SUNY is the middle one. This is an example of institutionally funded OER. So they, um, at Open SUNY, they have a grant program um, and the libraries and the university support OER creation there. And then the third example is LibreText. That is a chemistry textbook through LibreText. And that's what I was talking about was funded through the government grant, $5 million government grant. Um, as I said earlier, we have a faculty grant program here at Northwestern. Um, it happens once per year and we give $5,000, multiple $5,000 grants to develop open educational resources for a Northwestern undergraduate course. The grants so far have been awarded to faculty within the sciences, social sciences, and languages. Um, and in addition to receiving $5,000, which can be taken as a stipend or can be spent on student workers um, or spent on printing out your textbooks in order to provide them for your class, it can be spent on lots of things. Um, in addition to that, we offer library support, and that is in the form of open textbook training, copyright assistance, project management, and publishing services. So the easiest way to get started with OER is just to adopt it. Um, there are many resources for finding OER. We're gonna go over two of them today. Um, if you find something that's suitable for your class, you can begin using it right away. There's not much that you need to do. Um, a lot of OER is available in multiple different formats. As you can see from this example here, there are these little box buttons. This one is available as a PDF so that students could download it if they wanted to, or you as an instructor, you could download it and then um, edit it if you wanted to. Um, and it's also available online as a website. So if you find something that's suitable for your class, you can begin using it right away, or you can contact the libraries and we can assist you with finding and adapting resources. Um, the textbook that's pictured here was one of three that Professor Shelby Hatch from Weinberg adopted. Um, she got, uh, she received one of the grants in the first year of our grant program, which was two years ago. And 
she decided that she wanted to take three different open textbooks. She saw content that she liked from three of them and turned them into one textbook. She was teaching a course that was chemistry for non-chemistry majors. So she took these three different textbooks. We assisted her with formatting and things like that. And then um, she wanted to print them because she had two use cases for the OER. The first was that she wanted to use it to teach in Northwestern's prison education program. Um, and the students there didn't have access to computers. So after she edited the textbook and um, customized it for her class, then we worked with a printing company to print them at cost, which was a lot cheaper than any chemistry textbook you could ever get from a commercial publisher. Um, so she printed out copies for her class and then brought them um, into class with those students. Following the first quarter of teaching with it, she found that she wanted to make some additional edits to it. And so she edited it again and um, she had plans to teach with it. I, she might have taught with it this past spring, um, but she had plans to teach with the edited, updated version um, on campus with Weinberg students. And then that version, since she didn't need to print it out for those students, she could just make the link available for the students and then that could be put into Canvas or the students could print at cost. So let's see if there's anything else in the slide I wanna mention. So the libraries, this just goes over a little bit of support that we have. Um, if you wanted to start using OER, you could consult with a librarian. We could help you find available resources. Um, we could help you make copies and make edits if you wanted to, help you format. Um, you would just have to give credit to the author of the original OER and then distribute to students in multiple ways. You could upload the PDF to Canvas or send a link for the print on demand version. And you could even, Amazon has a, a printing company within them. And so you could take the PDF and actually make a record within Amazon and then share that link with students and students could order the book. Um, at cost if they wanted to, if, if it's important that they have a print version. So perhaps you've looked for relevant OER before and either you can't find something that suits your class or what you found isn't rigorous enough. Um, a lot of elite institutions like Northwestern have been slower to the OER game. So a lot of OER content that exists out there was created for standard high Courses, so some beginning level courses. If you teach upper level courses or courses um, that are maybe a little bit more niche and specific, you might have a more difficult time finding something that's suitable for your class. And so if you're having a hard time finding something that's suitable for your class, it's a perfect time to consider developing your own OER. Um, since there are so many gaps, we would love it if Northwestern faculty would begin contributing to OER scholarship in that way. Um, if you're interested in exploring creating your own textbook, the process would include meeting with a librarian. We would look for existing OER that may be suitable to adapt, that would work sort of as a foundation that you could adapt. Um, we could also help you to create an outline for your new materials, and we could source writing assistance. Uh, lots of faculty who are using and developing OER work with student workers um, either to take notes or um, help organize content or find open content on the web. So we can help with creating a job description for students um, or just project manage in that way. So this is an example of an open textbook that was created by Professor Aaron Kuiper in statistics. This is for a class statistics 202 intro to statistics. Um, Aaron received an OER grant in the first year and um, originally before he received the grant and redesigned his course, the course materials were between 150 and 250 dollars because students had to purchase the textbook. And then also he was using um, programming software that costs, I believe, $100, as well as online labs. And so when he switched to this textbook, it ended up saving students 40, between $45,000 and $75,000 in one year. And once you make the switch to OER, then that's 
student savings every single year. It's not just the one year. Um, one thing I'll point out with this book is that it says here, March 27th, 2020. Um, so in addition to saving students money, which is a great benefit, one other great benefit of using OER is that you can continue to update it as needed. So I think that I took this screenshot sometime in early April. Uh, and I know that Professor Kuiper has gone in and made changes as he's taught with it. Um, things change. Maybe he receives feedback from students. Maybe there are new concepts that he wants to incorporate. And with OER, you have the freedom to do that. If you want to peruse this OER, the link to it is kind of small, but it's on this slide. All right, finally, I wanted to talk about the benefits of teaching with OER. What is the relationship between the additional capabilities that Open Content affords and our teaching? Here is a definition of open pedagogy that I like. It is a series of practices which involve engaging students in a course through the development, adaptation, or use of open educational resources. The ability to reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute gives us as instructors new possibilities to empower students to contribute to the creation of knowledge rather than just consume it. Um, David Wiley, who is an open education advocate, came up with the concept of disposable assignments, which questions our traditional practices of giving students assignments that don't serve a purpose outside of the classroom. So regarding disposable assignments, he has said, there are assignments that add no value to the world. After a student spends three hours creating it, a teacher spends 30 minutes grading it, and then a student throws it away. Not only do these assignments add no value to the world, they actually suck value out of the world. <laughs> it's sort of an extreme quote, um, but I understand where he's coming from. So his answer to disposable assignments is what he calls the renewable assignment. And that would be something that would serve to add value outside of the classroom. This could be something as simple as having your class write a Wikipedia article, which is then accessible to people throughout the world, or creating PowerPoint slides that you could then use in future courses or that um, other instructors could use in their courses, or possibly creating tutorials for others to learn by. Here's an example for you. Uh, David Wiley, the person with that extreme quote, um, he taught this class called Project Management for Instructional Designers. And in that class, he took an open textbook that already existed, and he had the class revise it for their specific context. So I, I think that he did it um, each unit was a new chapter, and then students would be put into groups and they would write certain sections of the book um, during that week or during that unit. And then in subsequent semesters, after that class was done, he and his students added assessments, um, quiz banks, and other content such as videos, um, just ancillary materials to add to the textbook. The neat thing about this is that when students are creating knowledge and contributing to creating a textbook. They're experiencing deep learning and they're also getting an experience of writing a textbook. So after the semester was done, the students could put it on their resume that they were textbook authors, which is pretty cool. Another example is from a professor at the University of Plymouth in New Hampshire. Robin DeRosa is her name. She was using a literature anthology that was made up primarily of primary source materials that were already within the public domain. And this liter literature anthology, it cost $90, um, the published version that she had been using. So each student was paying $90 primarily to access stuff that was already within the public domain. And so um, Professor DeRosa wondered why she was doing that and maybe it was time to start an OER of her own. So initially she hired students and she had them go out and source 
um, this open literature, which was written anywhere between 1400 and 1800. And um, they created a spreadsheet and then all the links were there. And then after all the content was put into one place, then she as the instructor took all of that and excerpted it and edited it to create the bare bones of a textbook. So once she had the bare bones there of all the literature that she wanted to use, the semester started and then she had students work on creating the front matter to the book. So the students would read the primary text and then their assignment was to do research on the author or on the context of the text that they were reading and then write the intro to it. This is a quote from her um, after her experience of, of working with students to create that book. Open textbooks save money, which matters deeply to our students, but they can also create a new relationship between learners and course content. And if teachers choose to acknowledge and enable this, it can have a profound effect on the whole fabric of the course. One final example of open pedagogy. This is from Rajiv Janjiani, who is a psychology professor up in British Columbia, Canada. Um, he also is the creator of a super useful website called the Open Pedagogy Notebook. I encourage you all to go visit that website. There are lots of lesson plans and ideas if you're interested in open pedagogy. Um, in this example, he asked students in his class to create a test bank with multiple choice questions based on the content that they were learning. So instead of having them take an actual quiz, he decided that he would have them write the quiz. After they wrote the quiz and they peer reviewed them as a class to make sure that um, that they were of quality <laughs> uh, and also that they had the correct answers. These were then added to an open textbook as ancillary material after the course so that future instructors who were using that same textbook would then have a quiz already built in. Mm -hmm. um, we won't get into this today, but this particular example brings up an interesting discussion point about academic labor and the idea of um, putting students to work, essentially, to create something that others are going to benefit from. Um, there's lots of literature out there that talks about this, but um, my personal opinion is that if students are experiencing deep learning and contributing in a way that they will receive authorship credit, um, then I think it seems worth it. So some practical tools for open pedagogy. I'm sure that you've heard of some of these, especially since uh, two of them at least are available within Canvas now. Uh, the first is Hypothesis. This is a browser plugin that allows you to annotate readings and websites. You can also embed discussions within your text and share notes and collaborate on readings. Um, digital learning at Northwestern has workshops on how to use Hypothesis, and I believe that they might have instructions on their site, although Natalie might be able to speak to that better than I can. Um, they also have Perusal, which is similar to Hypothesis, but it has more features, and it's designed for annotation and collaboration on reading textbooks and OER. So Hypothesis is um, more so about annotating websites and Perusal is more about annotating uh, PDF documents that you upload into Canvas. Wikibooks and WikiEdu, uh, these are open content text, well, Wiki uh, Books is an open content textbook collection that anyone can edit. Um, but both of these are excellent tools for working with students to create a text. Students could create annotated bibliographies. They could update Wikipedia by contributing to or adding to underdeveloped articles, um, which gives students not only the opportunity to get experience explaining concepts for a public audience, but it also increases the available public knowledge on your course's topic. Natalie says, we are working on putting up more info on tools from our tools fair. Great, email will go out soon. Um, Google Drive, we're all familiar with this. This is a great tool to collaborate on presentations, documents, or spreadsheets. And then YouTube, as we showed earlier with the example of the openly licensed video, um, students can use YouTube 
to make instructional videos or do final class projects. And those can be incredibly useful to showcase for future students um, in the class. If, if students need help with learning new concepts, having other students explain them to them is one of the best ways to do that. Okay, so now that we've covered the difference. Oh, Alex raised his hand. Yes, Alex. Sorry to interrupt. I have a question about um, YouTube. Is yeah. that one also incorporated into Canvas and the Northwestern like ecosystem? Or if students make a video, do they need to have like their own YouTube site and then share the link? How does that work? Oh, that's a really good question, and I don't have an answer to it. I'm not sure of a Canvas plugin for YouTube. Um, I think my hunch is that individual students could upload their video on their personal account, unless you created a class account that all of the students could access, and then you would, or you could just have the students email you as an instructor to make the video available on your. Um, class account if you wanted to. One other option would be uh, uploading it to the Panopto uh, area, which allows you to store and share videos. Uh, that's a tool that's uh, supported and built into Canvas as well. And yeah. Natalie, just to clarify, when you say upload to Panopto, we're not using YouTube then, right? It's just like, just go to the Panopto plugin in Canvas and have them record and upload directly without YouTube. Without I'm asking because a lot of my final presentations are moving to this format and I haven't figured out how to do it yet. Yes, uh, there is a Canvas uh, app and there's uh, the ability to share to YouTube from Panopto. Um, but uh, that's, that's just one tool that we have. There are uh, workshops upcoming on how to use Panopto for video assignments as well if you want. Thank you both. So now that we've covered the difference between openly licensed and traditional course materials, you might be wondering about the benefits of OER, so I thought I would just summarize it. Um, the first is that it's free to students. When cost is prohibitive, the classroom is no longer equitable. And OER removes that barrier by creating a more equitable learning environment. The second is that OER is available on the first day of class. Students don't have to order it. Um, it's already created and you can upload it to Canvas and make it available to them. The third is that it's available in different formats. So it truly is the most accessible of resources. Uh, when you upload OER to Canvas, the students can access it while they're online within Canvas, but they can also download a PDF and keep it on their machines and they could access it on their phones or on their iPads and they don't need an internet connection to access a PDF that they've already downloaded. Uh, in addition, there are third party printing services where students could print the textbook at cost, which is significantly cheaper than buying it commercially. Uh, the fourth, um, when it comes to diversity and inclusion, OER is not inherently diverse or inherently inclusive, but its openness has enabled new voices and perspectives to emerge as authors, especially when utilizing open pedagogy or when remixing, revising, and curating content for our courses. So having students as authors is a way to promote diversity and inclusion. The fifth is that open licensing allows for greater control over course content because you can completely customize the book for your course needs. Um, I'm sure that we all have an experience of getting a textbook and liking most of it, but really disliking a certain section or a certain chapter. Or maybe the overall content is good, but you wish you could move things around. And OER allows you to do that. And then finally, OER provides opportunities to explore open pedagogy and innovative teaching practices. The examples I showed you today are just a handful of what's possible. So um, I encourage you to check in with me or to look at the open pedagogy notebook for other examples of how to do this. All right, where do you start? Um, First, I would say go to the Open Textbook Library. This is a search tool out of the University of Minnesota. It is a referatory that has 754 books as of 
July 7th, it had 754 full textbooks in it. All of the books had been used in at least two institutions and about 67% of them have reviews written on them that were written by faculty. Um, the library is unique because it only contains complete textbooks for use within quarter or semester courses. So the OER world, when you're searching for OER, can be overwhelming, but the Open Textbook Library is a great place to start and a great place to get an idea of, of what OER is out there. The second tool is OASIS. This is out of SUNY Geneseo. Uh, this is a search tool that will provide access to lots of those small bits of open content that I was talking about earlier. So if you want to experiment with incorporating open content within your course in fall quarter, but you're not ready to commit to a full open textbook, I would say go to Oasis and see what's out there. They pull content from 98 different sources and it contains some overlap with open textbook library. It has material from um, textbooks, audiobooks, modules, courses, and course materials. So here are some resources for finding OER. I just wanted to go into the Open Textbook Library really quickly. I know that we're running out of time just to show you what it looks like. Since we have someone in engineering here, I'm going to type in engineering and show you an example. Let's look at this one, Fundamentals of Electrical Engineering. So here is an open textbook. Um, can you all see this one still? Yes. Um, so this one, as you can see, it comes in three different formats. The attribution is CCBY. Um, if you wanted to share it within your Canvas course, all you would need to do is click on this link. It's then bringing you to OpenStax, which is where the book actually lives. And this is the book. So then you could take this URL and copy and paste it within to um, within Canvas. So this is a great place to start to start perusing. Go back to my slides. Now it's a black screen. Where did my slides go? There it is. Um, so the first resource is a research guide that we created here at the libraries and that has a lot of information on open textbooks in general. Um, the third one is the OASIS link that I talked about. And then the fourth one is uh, the, a website um, that leads you to AIR, which is the Affordable Instructional Resources Group um, and more information about open educational resources there. In addition, if you're interested in hearing stories from faculty, um, we have a couple of resources for you. Chris Diaz, who is the digital publishing librarian at Northwestern, he produced a short podcast episode that interviews faculty who took part in the OER grant program two years ago. Uh, we also have a video from a faculty member from Material Science and Engineering, Jonathan Emery, um, talking about his OER creation process. So that's the second link. Um, he did a really cool project where he was uh, continuing development on OER that he had already started. And um, what he did was he hired undergraduate students who were not within engineering to sit in on his lectures and take notes on his lectures. And that sort of started the seed for the textbook. After he had all of those notes, then he gave those notes to the graduate students that he was working with and had them um, edit and beef up and organize those notes. And then after the graduate students were done with them, they passed them on to Jonathan and then he um, created an open textbook out of it. Um, I like that example because it also incorporates uh, students from the beginning. So it started with students taking notes, taking in the information as they heard it and then giving it back to him. And I guess that's all I wanted to cover. We have three minutes left. I see there are some things in the chat. All right. Are there any questions that anyone has? Lauren, when we um, find some OER that we want to use, like the example you just went through, you say link to this website, is there a preferred method like 
is it okay if I just download the PDF? Because that was one of the other options. Is one sort of better than the other? Um, you know, it, it depends on your teaching context. I wouldn't say that one is necessarily better than the other. I suppose that if you download the PDF, that that and, and then link to that or upload that to your Canvas course, that would give students the opportunity to access it online within Canvas or to download it. So I would say maybe the PDF. Any other questions? I'll amend that answer too to say that if the text has dynamic content in it that is enhanced by the web version, then possibly the web version would be better. <laughs> all right, well, thank you all for um, coming and listening. And um, I didn't include my email address on here for some silly reason, but I will get an attendee list and shoot you all an email um, with the slides and, uh, and then you can check back on your Canvas course for the video if perhaps you wanted to watch this again or share this with a colleague. So thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, thanks. Nice job, Lauren. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie.